presentation today is going to be on rebuilding trust after a cyber or disinformation attack. Um, so as Wade Merrill said, my name is Davey Nyer. I'm from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, specifically, I'm with the Defending Democratic Institutions team. And what we do is we look at how cyber and cyber-enabled disinformation operations undermine trust in democratic institutions. So we have a very strong focus on the justice system um, and, and the courts in the United States, and we work with them to kind of develop countermeasures to, to go um, and address these different cyber and disinformation attacks. But we also do study some of the other democratic institutions as well, um, including media, elections, national security institutions, and of course, uh, private sector companies in, the, um, in our democracy. And so our DDI team, uh, is led by Suzanne Spaulding. She was the former DHS Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which is now the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at DHS. Um, and we work in close collaboration with the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Um, and so between Suzanne and the national security experts and the ABA folks that we have on this team, really what we're trying to do is uh, study, but then also kind of develop these countermeasures to help us deter and detect and mitigate any fallout from any sort of cyber incident. So uh, just a very quick overview into what I'm talking about today. Um, as you can see, this is just a, a image from one of our uh, pieces that we put out in CSIS looking at how to restore trust in national security institutions as a whole, um, why it's important to kind of rebuild trust and um, how you can actually go about doing that. And so in the context of this speech, um, I think it's just important to kind of at the outset say, you know, why it's important to be talking about rebuilding trust. Um, I think, you know, one of the main things is, is security and really cybersecurity specifically, um, it, it's going to rely on trust, um, whether it's the constant uh, information sharing and communication that we're talking about between the public sector and private entities and the larger American public to any sort of efforts that are trying to get people to engage with companies or or larger institutions after a cyber incident, um, really it's going to rely on having that kind of trust to move beyond any sort of activity once it's once something bad has happened in the cyber realm. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we're really concerned about, and I think this group can probably appreciate it more than more than others, is it is extremely frustrating sometimes when you talk about uh, cybersecurity and larger security conversation as an afterthought or as kind of a separate siloed conversation. Um, but really, that consideration can kind of cut the other way as well. Um, when you're talking about a cyber incident um, or, or some sort of cyber attack, uh, sometimes the immediate inclination is to try to go and see what is the immediate cyber fix, what are the technical vulnerabilities that we need to worry about, without giving as much attention to what are the larger considerations of, of trust of that institution that we need to be thinking about, what are the things that are compromised beyond just that immediate uh, system, whether it's the actual processes themselves or even trust in the actual um, ways that the institution is operating that kind of need to be addressed. And so that's that's kind of what we're getting at with this uh, presentation and, and some of the work that we do at CSIS. Um, and so, you know, what this presentation again is going to focus on is pulling from our work with the justice system. So I'll use that as some of the examples. Um, I'll talk through about some of the things we're doing with the courts, with the judges to rebuild trust in those institutions. But I really do want to emphasize that the takeaways and the lessons um, for how the courts and the justice system rebuild after uh, different types of cyber attacks are really applicable to other institutions um, and other companies as well. So just wanted to kind of say that at the outset. Um, so in terms of just the recent attacks, uh, I just put a few of them up there, and unfortunately, there's a lot that, that I can pick from there. Um, there's obviously just a lot that we still don't know. So a lot of the initial investigations are going to rightfully focus on what were the technical vulnerabilities that need to be addressed, or what were some of the reporting processes um, that need to be changed to make sure that this kind of attack doesn't happen again in the future. But obviously, there's still so much that we don't know. So for any of the types of recent cyber attacks, um, there's always that concern about what is the real, the full extent of the information that was accessed, um, especially sensitive information. That was definitely a, a huge thing of concern for the courts with the SolarWinds breach. 
Um, of course, there's the, the issue of what is the full scope of the attack. So it's really hard to just say, oh, this attack was just for mere espionage, or this was merely just a ransomware attack. That's that's bad enough as is, but um, you know whether it's the issue of latent malware or any other sort of uh, you know undetected part of, of a cyber intrusion that we're just not aware of, um, that's always kind of going to be in the back of the mind and things that we we either won't know now or won't ever know really. Um, and then that kind of leads to the third thing, which really gets at why we need to talk about rebuilding trust, and that is the idea of the purpose of an attack. Um, it's really, really hard to discern what the purpose is, and oftentimes a cyber attack, even a hard cyber attack, um, can play a role in a larger information operation. So when we talk about information operations, the mind immediately goes to something like social media, uh, regular, you know, routine disinformation operations, which is a very, very big part of it. Um, but we also have to remember that these kind of hard cyber attacks also intentionally or unintentionally play a role in larger information operations um, because it gets people to start asking questions about how do we trust our institutions to protect our information or to keep us safe? Uh, what does this do and impact the trust between um, private sector and the American public or private sector and the government? And again, those levels of trust need to be very high, especially when you're talking about any sort of response uh, coming out of, of a cyber um, incident. And so with those kind of concerns in mind, um, there's two kind of initial big takeaways that I wanna highlight. One is just, like I said, cyber attacks can be part of a larger information operation. Um, so not forgetting that part and not forgetting the larger scope of what an attack could actually mean or the consequences of it is an important mindset to kind of get into when you're thinking about how to properly build out cyber preparedness plans or any sort of recovery plan after an attack. Um, and the second takeaway is that, again, these plans need to be so comprehensive that they're looking beyond the technical solutions. So when we're thinking about growing institutional resilience, what are the other things the institution needs to do to not only make sure that they're a less attractive target for future attacks, but that they're actually able to um, withstand in a, in a, in a very, um, uh, in a, in a way that's, I guess, able to, to get the trust of the public, how are they able to grow uh, from any sort of incident that, um, that faces their institution? And so just again, um, like I said, I'm gonna focus on the justice system. Um, the, the DOJ, the federal courts, the state courts um, have all, they, they were obviously worried and kind of on high alert about various disinformation attacks, especially in the run up to the election. That's a lot of the context in which we worked with the state courts in particular, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in a bit. But um, just wanted to highlight again that like even something like the solar winds hack uh, where the DOJ was breached and also um, a lot of the, uh, the federal courts are worried because their electronic filing and case systems uh, were breached in that larger attack as well. So a lot of things I'm going to go over in terms of what their appropriate response was um, is uh, the things, even though they were talking more in the context of pre-election, they're still kind of things that the courts are working through uh, currently. So a few kind of points that I wanted to make before I get into some of the examples that we're looking at um, is really just a few caveats about uh, you know who are the attacks, who are the attackers, who are the adversaries, and, and what are the types of attacks that we're concerned about. So I'm going to be specifically talking about um, instances of Russian disinformation operations against the court, but in truth. It's obviously not just Russia. There's a lot of other countries that are engaged in disinformation and cyber activities. Um, and it's not just foreign adversaries. There are a lot of domestic voices as well that are that are unfortunately contributing to the cyber and disinformation um, that's going after some of our institutions. Um, the second thing is disinformation operations and cyber attacks really do exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities of our own making. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, whether it's the divisive discourse or even just our institutions not living up to, to our expectations, um, those are things that traditionally make disinformation um, sit well and kind of easily spread. Those are things that bad actors are, are looking at, that they're looking to target. Um, it's very easy to kind of jump on those societal vulnerabilities and um, start seeding uh, you know, disinformation, amplifying, manipulating information. Um, so to the extent that we can kind of uh, 
you know, take away opportunities for bad actors to spread that kind of disinformation by addressing some of those weaknesses and vulnerabilities of our own making. Um, that is that is a huge step in the process. Um, and the last thing is there is this balance between people that are critical of our institutions versus actual disinformation or, or cyber attacks that are intended to weaken our institutions. So, you know, when we're talking about rebuilding trust, we're not saying or going after anything that's just critical of our institutions because that actually is important for our democracy. We need people to uh, constantly be looking to improve our democracy, constantly critiquing our institutions to make sure that they're better. Um, but that's not really what we're seeing with the disinformation that we're seeing from a lot of bad actors that are looking to actually say, not only are your institutions not great and they're not working, but they're irrevocably broken. Um, there's no way of, of redeeming these institutions and fixing them for the better. And so I'll give some examples of that, but that's really the kind of disinformation that we're worried about and the type that we need to kind of build plans around uh, to make sure that we're we're properly rebuilding trust after any sort of major incident. So like I said, there's kind of these harder cyber threats to the courts that you're worried about. So the hacking and leaking of sensitive court documents, altering data, protecting uh, any sort of sensitive information. And it's really easy to see how any of these uh, could actually be used in combination with or as a separate standalone disinformation operation or as part of a larger information um, operation. And um, you know whether it's leaking, selectively leaking parts of, of real documents and, and putting them with fake documents or um, altering the data in any sort of way, um, it becomes really hard for the courts or, or really any institution to come out and correct the record uh, with real information once the bad information, once the bad or manipulated uh, documents or data has already been leaked to the public. Um, but now I wanted to turn really to some of that disinformation that we're talking about. Uh, so I, I like to start with this incident in Twin Falls, Idaho. This is from a few years ago. Uh, it was a situation where there was a young girl who was um, allegedly taken into a basement by Syrian refugees, held at knife point and, and raped. And it was just a very, very horrible um, story. In actuality, it came out later that um, something untoward had happened in this basement, but there were no Syrian refugees, no knife point, no rape. Those were all embellishments that have been added and exaggerations that have been added later, uh, first by rumors and then spread by Russian media. Uh, Russian agents from the Internet Research Agency have been pushing this narrative on state-sponsored media as well as uh, social media. And so here are just some examples of, uh, you know, the, the IRA, uh, IRA tweets kind of going after the prosecutor, going after the judge, really kind of pushing this narrative that the court was against uh, this little girl. They were siding with these Syrian refugees over um, the, the American citizen in this situation. And you, your immediate sense might be, well, why didn't law enforcement or why didn't you know, the courts come out and correct the record? And in this particular case, because there were minors involved, there were certain privacy laws in place, which made it such that um, they, they couldn't come out and, and share the real details or correct the record. Um, by the time they were able to do so, the disinformation had already been out there for long enough, um, making it very difficult to, to actually say what had happened. And by then, a lot of the damage is already done. Um, this is uh, also from that same situation. Secured Borders was a Facebook group that was posting about the situation, trying to start a rally and bring people out into the streets. Again, citizens before refugees, getting people riled up in the city, saying that the courts and the institution were um, siding against this little girl. Um, but again, this isn't you know, a group of concerned American citizens that were trying to uh, you know, fix a wrong that had been done by the court, this was a foreign adversary coming in and trying to spread misinformation um, about what was actually happening in that situation. So these are the uh, some four narrative frames that we've seen with Russian disinformation against the courts. Kind of like the Twin Falls case, uh, we see situations where they talk about the justice system covering up crimes committed by immigrants, uh, we see narratives about the justice system operationalizing a racist and corrupt police state. 
Uh, we've seen things about the justice system supporting and enabling corporate corruption and how the justice system is a tool of the political elite. Um, these are narratives that, similar to the Twin Falls case, are either spread on social media, uh, state-sponsored media, and in some instances uh, with higher ranking officials within the actual Russian government. And so I, I bring up this case of the courts and the narratives that we're seeing for a few reasons. One is, as you can see from the four narratives here, um, they really don't play to any single political side. I mean, there's some that are, you know, you would associate with more left-leaning issues or, or trigger issues or, or right-leaning kind of issues um, that, that would... Uh, kind of get people riled up on that side. And we've even seen in some instances where in, in this one specific case, you'll have um, you know, accounts weighing in on both sides of the issue, even though they're coming from groups like the Internet Research Agency, um, which is all to show that sometimes disinformation is not intended to kind of prove a single truth, but instead to kind of get people to um, disengage, to kind of feel like the institution as a whole is um, kind of broken or inept um, and, and really kind of get people to not just, uh, you know, not trust maybe this information, but also any other information that's coming out from the courts to correct the record um, or any other uh, verified institutions that are trying to speak on this issue. But the other thing that I really want to highlight here is, you know, not only is this just the justice system. We've seen similar narratives like this for other institutions as well. I'm just focusing on the justice system here. But these are really things that are happening every day. It's not just one case or one-off cases here and there. Um, disinformation and, and democracy undermining threats are constant. And so institutions can't really wait until that one big situation, whether it's uh, something like a Twin Falls, Idaho case, where it's just a big case that everyone's kind of looking at or some sort of big cyber attack to start building their initiatives that are focusing on strengthening public trust. Um, those are things that, you know, even if an institution is uh, not thinking that they'll be caught up in some sort of situation like this, or they're not really thinking about how these larger narratives could play into what they're actually doing. In truth, these narratives are so pervasive and they're kind of already setting a foundation so that even if there is some sort of big cyber attack, it's really easy to kind of drive uh, the narratives around that cyber attack into one of these pre-existing narratives that have already been um, set up you know, well in advance. So a little bit about what we are doing with the courts specifically. Um, in the run-up to the election, like I said, we, we did some state court workshops with the National Center for State Courts and the American Bar Association um, in partnership with the Brunswick Group and Exadec. Um, and really the, the point of those, we uh, brought in the state courts, um, we'd have like three to five states uh, come in per workshop. These were two-day workshops. Each state team would bring in a, a group of people that included not just um, kind of their, their, their tech and cyber experts, but really their public communications folks, their judges, uh, sometimes the courts, uh, 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 the retired judges, bar leaders, anyone that they thought from their team should be involved in these kind of conversations about addressing and, and rebuilding trust after a cyber disinformation attack. So we ran them through a, a big cyber and disinformation tabletop exercises that kind of, again, brings in that combination of, of uh, an attack that includes elements of both cyber and dis like a hard cyber and disinformation um, attack. The next part was we uh, had a playbook development session where we work with the judges and the other individuals that are part of those state teams to think through what are the appropriate response mechanisms that we need to have in place um, in advance of an attack to make sure that we're properly prepared. But a lot of these states, they didn't have the luxury of just dealing with, you know, how do we prepare for this in advance? A lot of them were dealing with this, um, you know, at the time that they were calling in or had recently come out of a cyber incident. And we're really trying to think through what are the things that we need to think about to rebuild trust in our court? What was lost? Um, you know, maybe it was a specific type of uh, information was accessed, or maybe um, it was a, a disinformation around a certain case, but they really were taking a step back and taking stock of how did that attack really impact the trust and, and levels of confidence in that court and their decisions moving forward. Um, 
And the last thing that we did, which uh, kind of just helped our study, but really uh, is something that we've just constantly thought about, uh, we've done focus groups with how disinformation uh, kind of sits with different individuals, what their kind of takeaways are, what that means for their trust in institutions. And unfortunately, I mean, it does impact the levels of trust that individuals have. So um, it's not something that we can just kind of ignore and hope it goes away. There have to be active steps taken uh, to make sure that we're addressing any of the disinformation that comes up. So just a little bit on the, the playbook overview that we did with the Brunswick group and with the state courts. Um, I'll skip the first step just because um, yes, it's great to build resilience before a cyber event happens. And we do walk them through that. But the point of this presentation is more, what do you do after, uh, after something, after there's a big cyber incident? And um, I would say, you know, steps two and three kind of blend together because yes, it's very important to identify the right team and response plan and create that response option. Um, I would say here that when it comes to right team, the main thing is making sure that just because it's a, a cyber incident, it's not just the quote unquote cyber people that are in the room. Um, there's a reason that we specifically have the, the communications team, but then also the judges or the kind of other allies of the courts um, or lawyers that are affiliated with that court coming in, because it is really an all hands on deck situation when you're trying to think of rebuilding trust or, or responding to a cyber incident in the proper way. And when you're thinking about the messaging and the best practices there, um, it's just as important to think about who is doing the messaging as it is what you're actually um, trying to convey to the public. So for instance, going back to the Twin Falls, Idaho case, um, you have a situation where uh, the judges and the law enforcement officials were not able to come out and quickly correct the record because there were privacy laws in place that prevented them from doing so. Um, so to make sure that you're quickly addressing that disinformation, some of the things that we tell judges, for instance, is we practice thinking through how can retired judges be brought into the conversation to maybe talk through procedure and process um, in a way that maybe the sitting judge might not be able to. Or how do you find kind of those unlikely allies um, that can kind of speak on behalf of the court and talk about the court's integrity of process um, and integrity of procedure, um, even if you know there might be disagreements on you know specific cases or decisions and stuff. Um, it's always important to have those people lined up and ready to speak on behalf of your institution as you're in that process of, of trying to rebuild and recover after a cyber incident. So with uh, companies that could mean um, maybe you know, other industry experts or competitors that again, might have vested interest in, in being competition in other regards, but when it comes to dealing with a cyber incident, for instance, um, those could be folks in certain instances um, that you turn to to help with that messaging as you're rebuilding and coming out of, um, out of an incident. So these are just um, a few of the specific examples I was pulling out in terms of like the actual communication uh, strategies and, and tricks that, uh, you know, we, we tell the judges to do as they're thinking about how to rebuild and come out of a, of a cyber incident. So, you know, things like leading with facts and avoid repeating disinformation or kind of building those relationships with stakeholders, um, training and testing responses. All of those things are, are basically, I'm sure a lot of you have, have thought through that um, as you were, uh, you know, thinking about some of these issues. I will say the last one is particularly important just in terms of speaking clearly and, and easily when communicating with the public and media. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but it's something that we've had to always kind of re-emphasize, especially with um, the legal community, like don't kind of keep the conversation in, in like legalese and, and in the cyber context, don't kind of make the conversation too technical so that um, the public is not able to like engage with the concept or understand what's going on. So that, especially when you're talking about rebuilding trust is a, is a huge issue that we kind of keep emphasizing. Um, but then the last one is, is really important and the, um, the conversation across all the different workshops are somehow kind of steer in this direction. And that is um, how can we use civic education to help equip citizens to withstand disinformation and, and really help us in that um, kind of rebuilding and recovering process. So these are two of our uh, CSIS DDI reports um, that kind of detail the nature of the threat, go into a little bit of detail about um, you know, how you can uh, recover or, or build resilience against some of these threats. Um, but I do wanna highlight that in both of them, you know, 
one of the key takeaways is the threat landscape is constantly changing, especially when you're talking about disinformation or cyber attacks against institutions. And so with that in mind, I mean, obviously um, there's going to be technical solutions. There's going to be ways that you can try to shore up any sort of vulnerability, but you need to have something that can grow overall societal resilience. Um, you need to have a way that, you know, even if you're doing all of this pre-planning and preparedness to communicate with the public, you have to have a public that's willing to engage with you in the first place. You have to have a public that's receptive to any messaging that you're putting out there um, and, and willing to kind of work with you to bring, you know, companies or institutions back um, after any sort of major incident. So with that in mind, I mean, that's how we've kind of landed on this idea that civic education and, and really a reinvigorated civic education that includes components of civic literacy, um, or sorry, media literacy and uh, critical, think critical thinking training. Um, those are all things that can be kind of added to, um, to help society kind of move forward after any sort of incident. This is not something that we alone kind of um, have been thinking about. Um, some major commissions have also similarly landed on these kind of conclusions. Um, the National Commission on Military and National Public, the National Commission on Military and Public Service, excuse me, and the National Cyberspace Solarium Commission um, both have strong recommendations in support of reinvigorating civic education as a way to support some of their um, major foundational uh, recommendations. They think that um, for some of their recommendations to stick and really take hold and be effective, you need to have that kind of uh, informed and engaged citizenry um, available as well. And so, you know, I, in the interest of time, I won't spend too much on this, but really, I mean, from the national security perspective, um, we strongly see there as being a way to integrate STEM education with civic education. They must reinforce each other. Um, and, and truly having that resilient uh, society is a way that we grow and, and fight and have that societal resilience against ongoing cyber and cyber enabled threats. Um, one thing that we constantly focus on is, you know, it's not just the important to make sure that we have the best and the brightest innovating and, and working um, in whether it's the tech industry or just larger cyber field in general. It's also important that all those individuals have that kind of civic consciousness, civic awareness as they go about um, their their day-to-day uh, -day lives and, and, and have their careers, especially considering the ways that those companies are kind of at the front lines um, and, and helping us either deal with any sort of cyber incident or are themselves kind of targets of um, cyber attacks. And so um, having that kind of civically aware public both in the companies themselves, but also receptive uh, in the larger American public is, um, is definitely key. And so I think, you know, of course that, that seems like a separate tangent. You're like, well, that's great. Civic education is important, but how does that you know, help us when we're trying to rebuild or come out of an immediate cyber attack or cyber incident. Um, I did want to just point you to um, our civics uh, strategic dialogue series at CSIS. It's a public event series. Um, here are some of the events that we've had uh, with Justices Gorsuch and Sotomayor. Uh, we recently had um, FBI Director Chris Ray, uh, Microsoft's President uh, Brad Smith, and former DHS Secretary Jay Johnson, and what all of them have kind of um, really pushed in their in their differing speeches was something along the lines of how important it is for their industries and for national security as a whole to have that civically informed um, you know workforce, but to also have that larger um, you know engaged citizenry. And again, it seems like something that wouldn't come top of mind when you're thinking of how to rebuild trust after any sort of cyber attack. But in truth, I mean, civics is something that's been deprioritized so much over the decades um, to the point that, you know, right now, you know, the, the federal spending on STEM is somewhere around like $54 per school child annually versus for civics, it's around five cents per school child annually. Um, and this is in no way to say, you know, we should take away any funding from STEM or that we should kind of stop or, or slow that down anyway, because that is very critical to to um, enhancing our national security. But there are ways that civics can and should be integrated into that conversation, especially for cyber related STEM um, courses. And, and when we're thinking about how uh, 
companies and institutions um, you know, need to engage with the public later on. I mean, in truth, institutions that are able to be held accountable or are able to kind of um, interact or show that they're uh, you know, engaged with the larger public, those are the institutions that are able to kind of garner that trust. And, and um, again, that's not something that can happen overnight. And it just kind of reinforces again that this is a conversation that can't happen after the cyber incident. This really needs to be planned out ahead of time um, so that, you know, God forbid, if you do end up in a situation where you're trying to rebuild, um, you know, after an incident, you're in a much better position to do so. And so, you know, the, there are four kind of takeaways that I sprinkled in throughout the presentation, um, but I do want to end on this last one, which is how do you train to fight in the light? Um, it's something that Suzanne, our, our director of our project, kind of always ends on. She very eloquently talks about how, um, you know, the shelf life of secrets is vanishingly thin. And so that's why we need to fight in the light. And what she means by that is, you know, we're moving into a time where it is increasingly difficult, almost impossible to keep secrets, especially with the types of cyber attacks or, or dis cyber attacks and, and breaches that we're considering today. Um, and even if we do have secrets, they're really expensive to kind of keep in today's day and age. So moving towards more transparent systems really is um, something that companies should think about anyway, but especially when they're thinking about rebuilding after um, any sort of incident. And I'm not talking about any sort of like radical, um, you know, overnight changes that, uh, you know, insist on some sort of transparency, but instead, institutions taking steps to actually, um, you know, whenever there is a situation where they can err on the side of being more transparent, trying to do so. That's really difficult to do, especially when you're thinking about cyber. There's kind of this, um, this tendency to feel like you need to keep close hold to the nature of the, the attack or, or um, you know, some of the information taken or things like that. But in truth, wherever it is possible to be transparent, that might be the best course of action. Um, if for nothing else, I mean, yes, it does help rebuild trust, which is crucial, but that is also the way that the world is moving in. That's the reality of today's situation. So the institutions, the companies that are able to kind of lean into that and prepare for that and anticipate that better are the ones that are going to, um, to definitely thrive and succeed in the future. So uh, with that, I will stop my screen share again. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing any questions you might have. Man, so as someone who works in intelligence, that like definitely hit me hard, right? And I wanna like a comment that someone made to me early on working, he says, there's, there's military grade weaponry being used against the public via social media. And I think this isn't hit on enough in the general sense of the population of how much that's really going on. And it scares me a lot just because of that. But that was an awesome presentation. You mm -hmm. should definitely look at giving that at other places. That <laughs> by far. Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we did lose Meryl. Her daughter needed some attention, so it's just <laughs> me. Uh, if we have any any questions in the Discord, please let me know. Otherwise, I can talk your ear off on just uh, <laughs> for the next 15 minutes, too. Um, I uh, posted the two articles that you did, that you showed in your presentation in the chat as well, which I'm probably gonna go read after this. Um, so there's the link to, oh, okay, never mind. Um, what do you think is, for a normal person, What's the best defense against these type of attacks? So um, one of the things that's kind of concerned us is, you know, when you're trying to talk about like what should be media literacy or what are the things that you need to do, it almost seems like you're trying to force some sort of top-down solution of like, this is what you should believe, this is what you shouldn't believe, and this is how you should, you know, uh, think about these things. And, and that's why we've really kind of leaned back on that whole like thinking of a reinvigorated civics that also combines media literacy and cybersecurity awareness, basic cyber hygiene. Um, we're trying to find ways to kind of uh, put all of that together so that, um, you know, people are kind of, they're 
informed of the basics. They're informed of how to navigate their day-to-day -day lives in ways that are secure, like basic things like, you know, don't click on pals links or like, don't, you know, constantly like or repost things that you're seeing on social media. Like those are basic things that we can teach to everyone. Um, but it, it kind of just puts that awareness in the back of people's heads. So, you know, you can still believe what you want. You can still search for the information that you want but you're kind of a more informed and engaged citizen. That's the kind of trend that we we keep pushing. Um, so in terms of what is the, the big takeaway um, or the big thing that they can do to kind of protect themselves, um, obviously like, you know, until some of those bigger programs are, are established and built out, make sure that you're kind of aware of all the basic cyber hygiene rules and, and actively practicing them. Um, that I'm sure everyone on the in the group would, would yeah. say that, that not be emphasized enough. Um, and then uh, in terms of the civic side of things, you know, we're not just talking about what are the three branches of government, we're talking about like, what are the actual things that, um, you know, our institutions are doing and, um, you know, how are ways that we can hold our institutions accountable. And if you're interested in those kind of things, um, there's the Civics Renewal Network and CivX Now. Um, both of them are really big networks that have education tools that really can kind of meet users uh, where they're at in terms of what they're interested in, what they're concerned about. A lot of different resources from a lot of different organizations that are there. Um, so I really just encourage people to uh, check out the resources there because it really does um, give you a sense of why it's important, again, to have trust in institutions. Uh, gives you a little better appreciation of what's maybe, uh, what, why these are areas of concern. Um, and, and again, just gives you that sense of awareness. So as you're operating and navigating your day-to-day -day life, um, you're also just kind of keeping those basic security measures um, yeah. in the back of your mind as well. I love, I love the way you guys are going at it with the courts as well. It's almost like you're trying to stem the disinformation before it even exists, right? You're, you're not just putting a Band-Aid over it. You're solving the problem before it happens, which is awesome and mind-blowing like i literally have the conversation of this with like friends weekly about hey you shouldn't post this and here's why so it just blows my mind that there's an actual group out there who's preaching it and i had no clue about it and it makes it honestly makes me really happy that you guys do stuff like this um yeah i can't even like like i'm emotional Ooh. Well, thank yeah, you for, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, being yeah. interested. And I will say, though, that one of the unfortunate things is, so I mean, even how we started looking at this is because um, Suzanne Spaulding, who's the director of our program, when she came out of DHS, uh, she was there in 2016. So, you know, saw what was happening with the elections, the disinformation operations happening there. And so she really thought she was getting out ahead of this. Um, she is a lawyer by training. And so really wanted to see, you know, what other institutions that are critical to our democracy could be impacted or, or could be targets of disinformation campaigns. So she started digging around. She saw where there's an opportunity for disinformation, hoping that, you know, she was getting out ahead of this. But unfortunately, I mean, kind of as you're saying, and, and some of these institutions, they have been targets for some time. They've kind of gotten in the crosshairs of um, other larger democracy undermining narratives. So, you know, people think of the elections being the big times when you see disinformation pop up. Um, but in truth, I mean, it's just so easy and cheap to kind of yeah. win the disinformation operation that um, you, you're seeing institutions uh, kind of they're not they're no longer getting caught caught in the crosshairs they're becoming direct targets and so um you know it, it becomes all the more important that um institutions are prepared for that and again it's not just russia it's now a lot of times domestic voices that are doing it a lot of other nations have taken a page out of that playbook and are similarly spreading disinformation when it's convenient so that's another reason why we kind of lean back on that how do you build resilience side of things um, because it has to be threat agnostic. It's really hard to to detect where it's coming from at all times. Uh, how much research do you guys do into the actual like campaigns and like the, so like the Twitter bots and like actually mm -hmm. tracking them and stuff like that? Yeah, so it, it that's probably the hardest part yeah. just because a lot of the information that we used for even like that uh, the beyond the ballot report that I showed earlier. Um, those were accounts that were verified by the platforms or that the platforms identified as coming from um, the internet research agency uh, a lot of the accounts were those that were published by 
uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee. So we kind of have that 100% you know, verification that that's who we're talking about in those cases. A lot of times we can go and look into different networks um, pretty much thinking that they might be from X, Y, or Z bad actor, but we don't actually have uh, a way to verify like if it's actually coming from an adversary versus um, a regular American citizen, which again, they still could be spreading misinformation, yeah. but the consequences and the way you respond um, could be slightly different based on where, you're com where it's coming from. Uh, which is why we always have to say that this is the, the reports that we're uh, showing or the, the the examples we're showing are just to show, um, I guess, the, the types of disinformation that's out there, but we can never really make comments about the full size or scope or scale of um, of these disinformation attacks, just because we don't have eyes on on what's actually out there, and that's one of the things that a lot in the a lot of people in the research community are trying to push for um, how to get just more timely data from the um, from the platforms themselves, um, and and ways that we can kind of just do a better job of sharing that information, so we can come out with some of these larger takeaways and raise awareness um, with the American public. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are we are greatly limited in the um, the uh, the abilities to kind of fully do a scan of um, the narratives coming up against the courts, for instance. Yeah. So uh, there, my uh, I live my life by like three basic quotes that my parents always used to reel in me. Right. And one was like, uh, "When in doubt, gas on." So like, always go for it. And then my mom always used to say like, "Life isn't fair." So I always just always remember that. But my dad always hammered one into me, which is believe nothing what you hear and half of what you see, right? <laughs> so whenever I read anything on the internet, I'm like, all right, half of that's true. But oh wow, you're I'm gonna well, I'm gonna have a lot of reading. That's in that. probably the, the the bumper sticker that we should have when we present yeah. things. Just have that have that healthy sense of paranoia um, as you're reading things. We try to make it such that people are are just paranoid enough that they're being critical consumers of information, but not too worried that they're completely detaching from being yeah. engaged participants because that that that's that's, that's the that. other bad consequence right like that's how you ruin a democracy by not having people fully freely um engage in society so striking that balance is is another thing that's just tricky but um trying to trying to figure uh, out a way to do that walking that edge wow awesome talk uh super appreciate it and uh, I hit you up on LinkedIn. So if you ever do any more, I definitely want to know about it. Um, so we are coming up on the end. Uh, the last talk of the day, our closing keynote is going to be in four minutes. So if everybody wants to transfer all the way over to number to the first channel and that's closing it. Uh, Davey, thank you very much. I appreciate your talk. Uh, hopefully I'll talk to you again sometime because I'm super interested. Uh, everybody else, have a good day and uh, see you over in track one.